we've got uh, a plug-in fleet with Chrysler, the Sprinters. We actually did a fuel cell plug-in for Shanghai Automotive uh, that is being put in the vehicle now and the GM Saturn do. So the, the, the technology is getting to a point where it's good to get it into a vehicle and find out what's going to happen when you get it out on the road so that we can have the same level of confidence we do in hybrids. And so I, I think what, what I'd like for um, the, the group here to recognize is that we are making um, significant strides in the technology. It's very promising. And we're getting to a point now where we'll, we'll work through those technology ch uh, challenges. We've got to also turn our focus to how do we make these things affordable so we can make a lot of them. We can develop a diverse supply base because I've got to be honest with you, as much as I love my, my Asian partners, I want to see the United States once again be considered to be a dominant force in advanced technology, relevant technology. We'll have to be developing our supply base here in the United States. We've got to uh, establish our manufacturing infrastructure. We can rebuild it, and we're going to have to build new skills. So I think there's a lot of potential. I think there's a lot of reason for us to be optimistic. And I think there's a lot of, um, I, a lot of reason for us to believe that irrespective of the numbers of how much uh, oil will be displaced, that we're on a path, and we're on a path that we need to accelerate and focus and work together. And clearly, government is going to have a significant role in that in terms of providing incentives, not only for the customers to buy it, for, but for manufacturers to want to do it here and to build that infrastructure and build that capability here in the United States. And I believe I stayed with the rules in three minutes, right? That was fabulous. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> Staying within the three minute limit. I'm going to start out with a question from the web. Um, this is from Stephanie Cohen, who's a local freelance reporter. And, and the question is, will GM's Volt, promised for 2010, be successful in the US? And more broadly, what will determine whether an, an American automaker can be successful in mass producing plug-in vehicles to US consumers? So even though, obviously, we don't have GM, I'd, I'd just be interested if, you know, particularly on the end, whether you know, Bill or Marianne can speak to, you know, what will determine success for companies that are, are particularly marketing plug-in hybrids for American consumers? Internally, to Toyota, is you hit your numbers. You're gonna, you, you, you go into this and you set your plant up and your supplier base. It's extraordinarily complicated to make a car. And you wanna hit your numbers. If you say 60,000 or if you say 40,000, you wanna hit 40,000. I almost lost my job on the, uh, because we said 20,000 on the Prius and we hit 50,000. That's as bad a problem has, has missing your numbers low. So that's number one, do they hit their numbers? Number two, does the product increase at a rate that makes it, uh, gives a reasonable payback? Do they hit the numbers on the price? Do the customers buy it? And does it increase and cause other products like it to hit the market? So that's what I say, do they really hit the numbers from a pure product point of view? And do other people adopt that type of, it's a series hybrid, it's, we use a series parallel, they're using a series hybrid. And will other people go toward a series hybrid? Well, I mean, you know, clearly we want it to be a success, right? I mean, none of us benefit if if it weren't to be a success. But I think number one, uh, you could call it an early success in that it has really um, instigated a lot of enthusiasm in the market for a technology, and around the potential of a technology and a really sexy car that offers a lot of flexibility around fuel usage and the potential for um, reducing uh, fuel consumption. So I think, you know, Bill, I, I absolutely agree with you, but I think we also have to look at it, how, how is it, is it uh, invigorating the marketplace? Um, clearly, um, the uh, battery suppliers are going to have to be able to demonstrate uh, capability to deliver a battery that will meet 150,000 miles 10 years. Um, and, and I would go back again and say, you know, we got to get vehicles out on the road. We have to understand what the usage profiles are going to be. We have to be able to design systems around them so that, yes, they can be uh, robust. And one, one last thing, and then Felix, I know you want to sure. jump all over this, but one last thing. I mean, I think if you take a look, um, Alan talked about selling hybrids over the last 10 years. Think about a hybrid even four years ago or five years ago, you're like, you know, I'm going to wait for a year or so until they get the bugs out of it. The fact is, the vehicles that are out on the road with nickel metal hydride perform extremely well. They're very reliable, high quality, and they're safe. 
and that's enabled us and given us permission to go forward and move forward with the technology. So I hope, and I, you know, I'm continuing to work with my partner, GM. I want them to be successful. We need them to be successful, just like Bill needs to be successful and Mark needs to be successful. Okay, and briefly, and then we're going to go to questions. Sorry, GM's yeah. doing a lot of things right. I don't know if they're going to succeed. Their board of directors made the Volt, turned it from a concept car to a production vehicle a week ago. Uh, they have said specifically a couple of real important things. They said, we're taking a leap of faith on this car because we think this is the, the direction the, the, the world is going. They're saying, in other words, it's the end of business as usual. And that uh, Atlantic article that's out there talks about that in depth. And they're being very transparent about it. They're saying they're opening up everything that's happening, which means that they get the American people on their side to help them succeed. And hopefully, they get all the resources they need to get them uh, to succeed. Uh, one other thing that they're doing, which is really important, is they understand this thing that we talked about this morning about dollars per mile. If you switch miles per gallon around and you do gallons per mile, then you realize the bigger the vehicle, mm -hmm. the better the benefit in electrifying the car. That's really important. Now that we've learned that opposing leather interiors is dangerous for your marriage and <laughs> underestimating car sales is dangerous for your career, let's go to the mic. And anyone who wants to ask questions, we have 15 minutes for questions. Um, let's just start with this gentleman. And My if you could identify yourself, it would be helpful. Sure thing. My name is Michael Jung. I work for Silver Spring Networks. We've heard about how important the smart grid is for making a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle world possible. And I think we understand that plug-in hybrids and other electric vehicles are a killer application for the smart grid, sort of like word processors for computers, let's say. How important is it that the endpoint become a ubiquitous, totally open, interoperable network of fueling stations, quote unquote, just like fuel pumps are today or wall sockets are today for electricity? How important is it that they become ubiquitous and open standard? And are we going uphill, given that state-by-state -state jurisdiction is what we're at right now, as opposed to a unified federal uh, perspective on this. Okay, it looks like Bill. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really hip that you understand that. Um, <clears throat> I'm a contrarian. I don't believe in nighttime charging. I don't believe in charge discipline. I don't think you ought to do that. Because if you start doing that, one is you start making the battery too big, the cost of the car gets too heavy. And two is you start trying to force cus consumer behavior uh, into a narrower band and, and less people want to get the car. So if we have ubiquitous charging, like you say, ki kind of like the web, where you've got an avatar on board your car that, that I might want to use coal electricity, Jim's Wolseley might want to use uh, uh, solar, and so we got different price points and we can negotiate with the grid to do that or charge roaming just like your cell phone. I don't want to care where I plug my car in and I don't want to have to swipe a credit card or if I can call my car up on my iPhone and have it turn on the air conditioner or the heater and take that hotel load off the car so I have more battery for traction. That's why I think it's really cool what you're talking about. Okay. Tom or Alan, do you Well, I, I think this, the, the, the smart technology uh, that you mentioned is coming uh, on, a, on a whole different front other than the electric vehicle uh, because it makes sense to the consumer from the standpoint of, of every usage you have for electricity. But I do think that it, uh, for the vehicle, it's going to uh, offer multiple opportunities. And I think whatever batteries we choose, uh, customers will, will choose to, in many cases, to, uh, to charge their cars you know, on, uh, on off-peak power uh, because the price differential is going to be so incredibly different. It will be amazingly different. And for our industry, it, uh, uh, the reason we'll be able to do that is because we are probably one of the more inefficient industry be because we can't store electricity. <laughs> if we were in the hotel business, we'd probably be close to bankrupt because from a capacity factor, you, 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 need, to, you need to fill up uh, those power plants. We don't want to build additional power plants. We won't need to with the electric vehicles if we can get the, the, the power uh, charged overnight. Okay, can we go on to the next question? Thank 